We're to start our first session of book club. And the first chapter is about understanding LLM. It is re a really simple uh, chapter. It has no coding, but uh, I try to um, explain the parts of the book that were uh, a bit foggy to myself and to help uh, others understand the uh, structure and architecture of LLM. But I will go through every uh, part of the chapter one uh, step by step. Um, and if you have any question during the lecture, please ask right away because I think maybe the concept of LLM architecture may be a bit complicated. So please uh, ask and uh, try to follow along. Okay. Uh, we are, I'm going to talk about uh, what natural language processing is and uh, its uh, evolution. And then I'm going to talk about the LLM application and architecture and training data set and building LLM, stages of building an LLM. The author tries to uh, believe that by uh, learning and building a LLM from ground up, we could learn the mechanics and limitations of uh, LLM, so we could use it uh, for our needs, especially in, our, in medicine. And I hope, I hope by the end of the book club, we will be able to do that. Okay, natural process, natural language process. LLM is a part of natural language processing, uh, which is a field of linguist and machine learning that is dedicated to uh, understanding human language with machine. And the first models were really primitive and uh, really uh, time consuming. They were rule-based rules uh, written by a linguist and they, were, um, they, had, uh, they needed a, really a lot of effort and they had um, poor uh, performance compared to the models we have today. For example, uh, linguists have to uh, write every code for uh, understanding language, for example, um, if a word follows the word there, it's probably a noun. And it was really uh, primitive for uh, what we have now. Then the machine learning uh, jumped in and they tried to use large training data, but it was also time consuming because they had to feature engineering the data set. And, uh, but it was really, uh, it, there was a really significant improvement in the performance of the NLP and we're really good at uh, performing a specific tasks like sentiment analysis or classification. But uh, with the emergence of large language models, uh, the previous mach machine learning models are uh, quite obsolete and um, and the, with LLM, uh, we just provide the training data set and create the model architecture. And the model learns and tries uh, to understand language by itself. We don't have to teach him the syntaxes, the, teach it the syntaxes, the, uh, con the sentiments or uh, else. And they're really perfect at generating text, as you know, and uh, they are able to perform uh, one single model trained for a specific task, can uh, do a wide range of tasks that we haven't uh, meant initially. LLM has a lot of applications. You may be familiar with uh, almost all of them, but they were first originally built for translation. And uh, now there are text generators, sentiment analysis, text summarization, and uh, content creation chatbots, and now they're using being used for searching through databases. What is the key factor that makes LLMs what they are today? How did they outperform the machine learning models? And what was the key factors influenced that? The first uh, factor, the first uh, contributing factor is the LLM architecture itself. It's uh, made of a transformer model that is using a self-attention mechanism that I will try to explain attention mechanism in uh, the following slides. And I think 
ma the major part of today's lecture. And the second uh, factor was the availability of large training data sets that uh, made uh, LLMs better than the previous NLP pr uh, processors. So LLM architecture con uh, consists of transformer models and they were first built for machine translation. Um, uh, they uh, con um, the LLM large language models and transformer models are used synonymously in the literature, but not all LLMs use transformer models and not all transformer, transformer models are used for uh, natural language processing, but uh, they may be used interchangeably. Uh, the transformer models consist of two parts, one encoder and decoder. The encoder, uh, the first, as I said before, uh, they were meant for a translation machine. They were supposed to translate English text to French or German text. Uh, the encoder part um, gets uh, uh, the English input or as it was meant to, the English text as the input and tries to convert it to a meaningful contextualized embedding. Embedding means uh, machines or and models convert a meaningless text uh, to meaningful series of numbers. This is called embeddings. What encoders do, they contextualize these embeddings and returns a vector or matrix that is contextualized. Then decoders use the uh, contextualized embedding provided by the encoder and the translated uh, uh, translated um, text and uh, tries to predict and translate the next word of the English uh, input. It may sound complicated right now, but I will, I will go through, uh, step by step to understand what uh, every uh, um, concept, what every concept means. The core of the encoder and decoder uh, is um, lies multi-head self-attention layers. Uh, that is uh, the what made LLMs uh, what they are today. Multi-head self-attention layers. Uh, we will try to understand it and build by step uh, examples um, to understand what multi-head self-attention layers are. First, we'll uh, talk about attention. How does models, how does computer pays attention to the text we provide him? Uh, let's um, assume we have, let's assume we are uh, designing a movie recommendation system. The task is we give the movie recommendation system an input, a query, and it searches through the database, the movie database, and returns the movie that matches the most to our search term, our query, okay? Uh, first of all, the model has to convert this meaningless text to meaningful series of numbers or embeddings uh, to understand what the query is and what is uh, what the movie database contains. To you do that, uh, we use two independent neural network um, called query neural network and key neural network that uh, each converts the corresponding uh, input to their embeddings. Uh, for uh, the sake of uh, this example, for understanding it more, um, we I will try to, uh, let's assume that these series of numbers, for example, the query embedding, which is a shape of, which is with the shape of 512, stores 512 feature about our text, okay? Now, uh, let's assume that the third leg of our uh, matrix or vector is uh, related to um, violence content of our texts how much the input text is violent. Uh, and the key embeddings uh, has, uh, let's assume the key embedding has the same uh, order. And the third index for the key embedding uh, refers to how violent the key embedding 
input is. So uh, we are searching for a, we want to watch an action movie. Let's assume that the, model, the, the query neural networks gives the value of 10 for the violence uh, index. And uh, the key embeddings, the, neural, the key neural networks uh, uh, predicts the violence of the diehard based on its title and introduction uh, to be 10 and for Forrest Gump uh, to be one and the Shining to be eight. Now, if we want to uh, use this uh, as a filter, use the query as a filter for filtering the movies, uh, we can use the dot product of the query embedding by the key embedding. And um, I will show you how it really works. Um, if uh, we use the dot product of the query embedding and the key embedding, the third index of the query embedding, which is violence and is equal to 10, will be multiplied by, by the uh, third index of the key embedding, which is 10, results in 100. And it, by the same pattern, it will result in 10 for forest dump and 80 for the shining. So the result will be a series of numbers that is um, that Die Hard has a score of 100, Forrest Gump has a score of 10, and The Shining has a score of 80. So uh, the resulting uh, vector, uh, will, uh, we will uh, use a softmax function, which, is, um, which converts the unorganized numbers to uh, a series of numbers in range from zero to one, that they sum uh, up to one, which uh, results in a type of uh, vector that is um, that shows that probability. So now, when we uh, dot, we calculate the dot product of the query embedding by the key embedding, we will have the probability of the similarity between query embedding and the key embedding. So the dot product acts as a filter, as uh, something that could match this and uh, calculate the similarities between two uh, vectors. And the result is an attention score uh, that the query should give to each of the movies. Uh, the inherent uh, feature of the matrices allows us to uh, use multiple queries at the same, same time for searching through the database. And uh, as you can see, it can it follows the same pattern. Now let's level up our model. Now, so far we've built, we've seen a model that can um, uh, that can do movie prediction, that can predict, that can recommend movies based on our query, our search query. Now we want a model that can generate text. For example, when I say, uh, as a query, I say, I'm, I'm really, I want to watch an action movie. It searches through the database and creates text while greeting me, for example, says, hello, I'm really, uh, try Die Hard for an action movie, finds the movie I want and gives a short description of what the movie is about. For finding the movie, for corresponding to our uh, to my search query, we will, we will use the same model we created uh, a few minutes ago. We will use the uh, dot product of uh, the query embedding by the key pro key um, embedding and use a softmax function to calculate the probability uh, distribution of the match movie. Now uh, we have to um, we have two problems. First, we have to get the data from the query because the model knows my name and greets with my name. So we have to have a sort of input to our model with the query. And the movie and the model knows what the movie is about. So it should also have an input uh, from the descriptions of the movies. To do so, we will uh, use this, uh, the result, use this, uh, uh, probability distribution output of the softmax function as a weighted mean pooling. So we use this uh, vector and multiply it by 
a new value called value embedding. This is a new embedding created from uh, the movie database. It contains the title and introduction of the uh, movie and uh, we multiply it by the outcome of our softmax, softmax function, which results in uh, which results in a movie that has content, a movie that is cor that corresponds to our search query, and uh, has title, has introduction, and has a storyline. We add it to the search query that's provided by element-wise addition and give it to the model. This will help the model to use the query, for example, here, hello, I'm really, and uh, returns the storyline of the um, movie we were searching for. What we did here was using attention function, first described in 2017, uh, when in the transformer model um, by in the article uh, named uh, attention is all you get i think so the attention function uh, uses the softmax of uh, the uh, product dot product of q embeddings by the transposed uh, version of the k embeddings multiplied by the value embeddings And this is a short, a minor change that uh, tries to um, that adds a, a square root of dimen dimensionality of k, k embeddings, key embeddings, to um, eliminate the exploding uh, gradient uh, when uh, the dimensionality of the uh, key embeddings are very large. This uh, it's a minor technical thing, but it really doesn't have to do anything with the concept. But uh, I thought you might, it's better you uh, know the formula. Here's another uh, diagram of the, what we talked about, the attention function, uh, but showing the dimensions of each query and uh, query embeddings and key embeddings and value embeddings. And uh, just, you can take a look at it um, for, um, knowing the exact dimensions of this dot product multiplication. Now that we know how models attention to our words, our inputs, now let's uh, go forward to see what multi-head means in multi-head self-attention layers. In single-headed attention layers, the model, the embedding network, the key or query or value, a neural network that converts our inputs to embeddings, looks at the input text from one angle. But uh, by using a multi-headed attention, we can, um, for the sake of uh, our example, we can say that it can look through the, through the text through different angles. For, for example, the first row is uh, looking at the input text uh, from the syntax point of view. The second row is looking at the syntax from the uh, sentimental point of, view, point of view, and so on. So it can increase the information we gather from each embedding and enhances the performance of mo our model. And at last, self-attention layer. What does self-attention mean in the attention layer? In the previous uh, example we talked about, uh, we were using cross-attention which means that we gathered query embeddings from another source, which I provided. And um, we gathered the key and value embeddings from the movie database. This was cross attention. The key and value embeddings were, were extracted from a different source from the query embedding. But in self attention layers, we gather all the, all, uh, the embeddings from the same text input. Actually, it attends to itself, pays attention to itself. Now that we know what, how self-attention works, uh, what uh, does self-attention achieve? It is the way, it is the mechanism that LLM models uh, become aware of the 
become aware of the context, context of the text we provide them. Let's take a look back at the self-attention diagram. Uh, they are all provided, are, are, the query and key and value embeddings are all extracted from input text. And now let's just think about that. It's not true, but just let's, let's think that uh, now we have a new query that previously we had a query that please give me the um, an action movie. Now let's think that in self-attention, the query is where do I stand in this sentence? It is a query that each word asks uh, from the model. Now our query is the, where is my position in the sentence? And we have the previous key embeddings and value embeddings that are representations of uh, our initial sentence. Uh, like the previous model, we calculate the attention score using softmax of uh, dot product of uh, Q embeddings by K embeddings. And uh, the result is a vector, the result of the um, product, dot product of Q by K is a vector that knows the relation, uh, the words relation to each other. Now we uh, multiply by the value embedding. Now we have a vector that knows what it is and knows where it lies in the sentence. Now it is contextualized. And in the final models of the multi self attention layer, we add the result of the contextualized embedding uh, with the initial embedding of the sentence to, uh, as for the output of our model. So uh, I want to uh, elaborate more on how self attention works and why is it called large language models and how is it differ with fully connected layers. In fully connected layers, we had an input and a weight and a bias output. The weight, uh, the dot, pro dot product of weight uh, by the input uh, plus the bias resulted in uh, our output. If you change the input, the weight and bias are fixed. And of course, the output will, would change. If you see now we have one for one fully connected layer, we have one weight parameter and one uh, bias parameter. Now in self-attention, the weight parameter is softmax of the dot product of Q embeddings uh, by K embeddings. And the input X now is the v value embeddings and the bias is the um, X input itself as we showed here. Now we can see why it is called large language models. The uh, one in fully layers, we had one weight and one bias, but in self-attention layers, we have three fully connected this Q, Q, and Q network and V net and Q network and value network. In self-attention layer, if you change the input X, the weight bias will also change. And that is the description of multi-head self-attention layer. Now we know each part mean, what each part means. Let's go back to our transformer model uh, architecture from a few slides back. Each encoder and decoder has a multi -head, multiple multi-head self-attention layers. The encoder uh, only consists of multi-head self-attention layers, which uh, pays in, in several consecutive layers. It tries to understand what the text it means. It contextualizes text at each step. And the final result is an embedding, a context embedding that is uh, very understood by the model. Uh, it tr uh, spend a lot of time to understand what the text was. Now the contextualized embedding is uh, for 
feed it forward to the decoder as an input, and the decoder uses multi self attention layers uh, for the, their input test and cross attention layers for the output of the encoder. Uh, as I mentioned before, cross attention layers use the query embeddings from a different source. This is what I meant. The cross attention layer uses the query from the contextualized embedding of the encoder. Uh, in the decoder, several consecutive layers of multi head self attention layers and cross attention layer uh, can generate a text uh, that is the, um, that is contextualized and uh, the translation of the uh, original English input. There are variants of LLM architecture. Uh, one of them is called BERT, that is bi-directional encoder representations from transformers. Uh, why is it called bi-directional? As um, the self-attention layer in BERT pays attention to the word surrounding it in two directions. For example, the word on here knows exactly where sat and cat and, and mat lie and knows the, his, its relationship with all of these words. Uh, this is called bi-directional self-attention as opposed to the GPT that I will explain uh, in a moment. BERT models were designed for masked word predictions. Um, that is uh, when you provide a sentence for the model, for the BERT model, uh, it uh, randomly masks uh, one or two words from the sentence and tries uh, to understand uh, the concept of the sentence and predict the masked words. How it does, it uses, the on, it uses only the encoder part, the transformer model, so it's perfect for understanding the context. It's perfect for contextualizing a text input. Uh, as it is used for context analysis, uh, as the books, book mentions, that uh, Twitter still uses uh, BERT for toxic, toxic content recognition. Another version of LLM architecture is GPT, which you're all familiar with. It stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformers. Uh, it uses causal mass self-attention. It only pays attention to the words coming before the specified word in the sentence. For example, the word on knows its relation with the word sat and the word cat, but has no idea about uh, its relationship with A and MAP. It's causal mask self-attention. It only uses the, the decoder parts of the uh, transformer model, and it was designed for text completion tasks. Uh, uh, when you provide a text input for the GPT models, it tries to press, uh, it breaks it down to the uh, single words and tries to predict uh, the next word of the sentence. For example, this is our first uh, book club session, uh, the GPT model starts with this. The input is this, and it tries to predict the next word following this, which is is. This is a first book club session. Then uh, after uh, predicting is, it has it now has this is as uh, its input and tries to predict the next word. And step by step tries to predict all the sentence. It uses an autoregressive uh, pattern to uh, predict the whole sentence. It's proficient at zero shot and few shot learning. There are, there are terms that would be helpful to know. Zero shot means that uh, the model can perform uh, a, a task that was not uh, trained for. And few shot learning means that the model can perform a task uh, by providing the minimal set of uh, examples for the model. And it's obviously used for generating text and translation. Now that we know what LLM architecture is and how it works, uh, the other component that we want, that, uh, was, that, that was a significant contributor to the performance of LLM was the availability of large training data sets. 
Uh, large training data sets for GPT models uh, were represent a diverse and comprehensive text corpora, including billions of uh, words. And this diverse uh, data set uh, resulted in a model that can perform tasks at very various areas of expertise. Uh, here's an example of a training that here's an example of the training data set for GPT-2. Uh, it uses it used common crawl web text to book one, book two uh, data set, and they were um, their data description data set description is written here. The interesting part of the data set was that uh, the common crawl uh, consisted of 410 billion tokens, but the GPT model used only 880 billion uh, tokens. So it was just a small sample of the common crawl. But for the uh, Wikipedia, which only contained 3 billion tokens, for the training of the GPT-2, uh, they used 9 billion tokens from Wikipedia. So it means that uh, tokens in Wikipedia were used multiple times. And uh, that's, that's it. And now uh, I'm going to talk about the stage of building an LLM. Uh, for the building an LLM, we are we uh, have two options. First is pre-training, the second is fine-tuning. Let's talk about what each of them means. For pre-training, you should first have uh, create your LLM architecture, which is uh, what we talked about, the self function layers and uh, a few other layers following and um, few uh, normalization layers added to that that we will talk about, that we will read about in the next chapter but the raw llm architecture contains random weights and biases and that does not understand language at all we use an, a large unlabeled training data set and uh, after pre-processing we uh, give it to the model for training process of training a raw LLM architecture from unlabeled training data set is called pre-training. It results in a model called foundation model or base model that is able to understand language. Now we can uh, use smaller labeled data set and train the foundation model to do our the specific tasks we need it to do for us. This process is called fine tuning or transfer learning, which results in a, a specialized uh, model that can mm, do the task we meant it for fine tuning. For example, it can uh, classify radiology or uh, can perform as a chatbot. For example, GPT-2 foundation model it was fine-tuned and it is, uh, then the fine-tuned version is chat GPT. Oh, sorry, the GPT-3 was the foundation model and so on. And that's it, thanks for your attention. If you have any question, I would be happy First to- First of all, a big, big, big round of applause for Amirali. I mean, this is excellent work uh, for our first chapter. Thank you. No, Thank no you. claps. This is, this is excellent work. Wow. So um, uh, questions, comments? Okay, 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 good. Uh -huh. Edgar says, the, thanks for presentation, it was beautiful. Okay, Thank so- you. Anything new that people learned differently? And then seeing this, and by the way, the best way to make the best use of the journal club is to read before the the chapter, then listen, and then go back and read, because that's how you completely understand. So Frank? Um, yeah, this is a very good presentation. So yeah, not a question not relevant to the, the contents, but how, like, how did you make your slide? I think it's very good. 
<gülüyor> Ama... Ay, uh, if you mean the transitions, I use yeah the, the animations. Uh, like those are yeah, very good. Uh, for uh, I use the transition morph. What it does, it uh, morphs the previous the identical objects in the same slide. Uh, it morphs into the new location in the second slide. For example, mm -hmm. this is this is what you see. But this is behind the scene. Cool. For the I next slide, these mm -hmm. these uh, contents move from the right side to the context. It is important that the name, size, font, and color of the objects be the same uh, as the previous uh, marginal objects. Yeah, I can I can see that there was there was a lot of effort made here, mm -hmm. like. You have to like put the those like oh, blocks and then connect them together. Yeah, yeah, it's very it's very good to like when when explaining like very complex uh, content. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Um, yeah. Uh -huh. <clears throat> First of all, thank you very much, Amirali, for the amazing uh, presentation. I I did learn a lot, um, and I, I appreciate that you also went into depth um, more than what the chapter was um, explaining. Especially, you went into like the attention, multi-head uh, attentions, and all the details. Um, yes, so that that was um, uh, something new to me that I learned, and you explained it really well. Um, you also went into detail about the equations and how you tied the um, simple linear equations y equals w x plus b and how it um, how the self attention maps onto that equation, which really explains it really well. Um, I have a few questions. Um, so you explained that the attention where you have different new neural networks in in the attention, such as the query key and also the value. Um, are these the 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 structure of the or the architecture of each of these different or are they the same um and and uh and you also mentioned about the index uh because you, you you assumed that the index would match between the different neural networks like the query and also the key neural networks how do you ensure the index matching between those different neural networks Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for uh, your uh, for listening really carefully. Uh, the second, the first question uh, that uh, I I forgot what I wanted to say. <laughs> could you uh, could you repeat the first question? I think there's there's two two. Uh... Main question. The first uh, oh, one yeah, is yeah, yeah, you have okay, different okay, neural okay, networks. I remember, I remember, I yeah, remember. okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, they are independent neural networks. That is, um, do uh, they do embeddings in different way? They're not identical. That's why it has so many weights and biases. That's why it's language. That is the reason for the billion param parameters uh, for LMs. Uh, so they are independent, and the index match was, I don't remember if I said, I meant to say it, but it was just for the sake of our example, but uh, if I don't, I'm not sure if uh, they, uh, the index are match completely, but they have to at some levels, for example, uh, this is how the dot, um, dot uh, multiplication works, it highlights uh, similar uh, features of the matrices. So if, uh, uh, for example, the key embeddings is not, the third index of key embedding is not uh, directly pointing at violence, but uh, it should have some uh, uh, some uh, uh, relation with the violence. That is how the dot product uh, could uh, filter the uh, values and keys. But I'm sure it's not exactly matched. It's they are not 
uh, index matched. Uh, thank you. Uh, following on that, uh, let's say the third index was violence, um, but we started off with random weights and random biases. So you would also expect randomly um, that the distribution of the index would also be random. Um, in that, and also the the pre training is using unlabeled data set. How does it know that, okay, this is violent? or like this index is action or comedy like unless I like because um, if you have a supervised model like you can tell okay the first index would be violent second index comedy but in an unsupervised way uh, yeah, I really I don't, don't know, like, know the exact I'm answer, but thinking how, it's just yeah. self-supervised. So uh, if it does something in, um, for example, uh, in other way, it cannot be, I think it cannot be trained. If the, for example, the second embedding of the uh, query, embed query embedding refers to happiness and is it's multiplied by for example, uh, sadness in the uh, second index of the key embeddings, uh, it will result in a large loss of the function, the large loss of the model. Uh, it's not exactly, uh, it's not clear uh, that um, they have a corresponding uh, index, but I think they should at least refer to the same idea, to the same point in a way to be able to, it decreased the loss of the model, but I really don't know if it, actually, it is it is actually the case or not. I don't. Yeah, thank you. Other comments? So great presentation, Amirali. One thing I just wanted to mention is that you first described the uh, cross attention and uh, as you all know, we've been working on conditioning diffusion models on text, and we're using that cross attention module. So in that, we use the key value would be the uh, text modality, and then the uh, query and values would be the Q, the Q in the QKV. Q is the text. Uh, K and V are coming from the image. So that the image is conforming to the text that it's seeing. And also if we don't have cross attention, we use self attention in the image space so that the image is consistent all across. So for example, the top right corner is aware of the bottom left corner, something like that. Just wanted to bring this up and thank you. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Any other comments, questions? How was, did you learn anything new? Uh, yeah, uh, great presentation. Thanks for explaining. Uh, I'll go back to the book and read the chapter again. So it will make more sense. Okay. There's a comment from Yego who also puts a link in the chat about transformers. I think it's imperative that people look up this because this is such a transformative architecture, right? We don't just use transformers for the, um, you know, for text only, right? We also use them for images. So I think everyone should really try and do that. Uh, Lucas, if you're able to, did you learn anything new? If, if you're not able to, we totally understand. Uh, yes, I, I did. I think I really need to go back over the Transformers again. I saw that article that was put into the chat. I'm going to go back over through that and then go back over to the chapter again as well. Mm -hmm. Rosemary, was this clear for you to follow? Yes, it was. Uh, but I should read the chapter to consolidate what you said with my understanding. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, great. So, 
this was just excellent. This is, uh, I mean, there's no addition on the content because you just did a fantastic job. I think you're spending time on the mathematics. Um, I know that uh, you said initially that you were intimidated by this chapter, but I thought that uh, you approached it in a way to really understand it that uh, made it very easy for us to read and now go back and be like, oh yeah, I know what the Q, the you know the V, and all these equations are, right? So that was uh, just an amazing investment of time and uh, results uh, that made this very very easy. Uh, the organization was very very good, right? So you started very basic and then you kept building the blocks so that when you came later on to tell us, oh yeah, this is why this matters or this is why this is different, that we were like, okay, I, I know that. Or if I need to go back, I know the section of the of the, of the the book club that I can uh, watch. But uh, to you, what was new for you doing this process? Did you learn anything new? The whole concept of LLM architecture was completely new to me and I was, and uh, I had a hard time understanding it. So when I uh, I searched and I, I think I added the YouTube video uh, that I learned a lot from in the PowerPoint and I uploaded the PowerPoint in the chat. Uh, I, I really learned a lot from that. I tried to uh, implement it in my lecture. And if you want, you can take a look at it. It's about um, 50 minutes of um uh, explaining the LLM architecture. And I'm really glad that uh, I was able to uh, transfer what I learned and I'm really excited for the next awesome. sessions. Yeah, that's great. So I think one thing for me that in addition, and I was reading the book, uh, I thought you have to get a mastery of sort of this, this, this terminology, especially for pre-training and um, you know, fine tuning, right? Because we use them differently in sort of convolution or neural network, right? So it's not really related to our, I guess they're the same, but it's, it's a little, to me, how I understand them was a little different. And then I think that I had a more big respect. We don't really glorify the BAT models today, uh, right? The, and, and And I think that we, you know, I think if you want to, to, to me, sort of my, I'm looking at my notes, to, to me when you want to, this was, um, you know, when you want to generate new text, when your task is going to have new text generation, then GPT is really the right task, right? So if you want to rewrite, you want to do something, right? Because of that next token prediction. But, but, which is the masked prediction right so it's almost like a dropping and then trying to say something then those uh you know the bat uh, models are very good in test text classification i know the llms you know with the um with the fine the, not the yeah the fine tuning you can make it a classification right which is part of this book uh, but that's why the bat is good for sentiment or document categorization when you don't really need to generate new text and you just want uh, sort of insights, then uh, that's that's an important uh, thing. The other thing I was surprised about, I, I don't think I'd really spent time thinking about it, was sort of like the data sets. I knew they were large. What I didn't realize is that even if people don't disclose what data sets they were used, uh, that's only a fraction of the data. It's not all the possible data that were used for the NLM uh, training so because I always thought that it's everything right so uh, but I guess some did not uh, go back through that and then what else um, you know and then just terminologies right emergent was something that um, you kind of have to understand so they when the models show behavior that they were not originally trained for and then the this auto auto regressive nature, which is sort of like what you spend a lot of time explaining, which is going back and using the previous inform previous outputs as inputs for the future prediction, right? And there's a chart there that uh kind of shows that the uh, no, I I think this is a good uh base for understanding this. Um, and I really appreciate you leading us into the discussion 
uh, I have to say that you, this is your first time, but uh, usually we've discussed a previous book club, but you see this type of attention and detail pretty late in the book club. So I hope that other people who will be leading the other chapters, you take it that I'm explaining to someone who doesn't know anything and that they really just need to walk around and it, it, it improves your understanding. I think like Amirali is, you know, has walked away having a better understanding. He's someone who's actually using a project, using LLMs, using LLMs, you know, but I think this is going to uh, really solidify your knowledge, which sometimes can be elusive uh, in, in this rapidly changing architectures, okay? So I will, uh, unless there are other comments, I'm gonna 